Possession crucial from this. How much longer will the referee allow? Dublin lead by a point. And there's the whistle. It's over. It's over. We earned it by winning the last two matches on the road. And that's not going to be taken away from us. But what I love in Hurland, I love players that will never give in. He hits it. He hits it. Well, it's over the ball. Welcome along, everyone, to our latest episode of the RTE GA podcast. Myself and Rory are joined today by Eamon Fitzmaurice and Enda McGinley. And one of you is smiling anyway. Um, Eamon, you must have had a good weekend after that. Nice to see Kerry finally, I was going to say coming out of their shells, but uh, they did more than that this weekend, didn't they? Uh, yeah, they played very well uh, on Saturday, Jackie. It was a very, just it was a professional performance and you know all of the players played well really there was no there was no bum notes anywhere and it was just a real team performance a very united performance and for all the rest of us it was great it was the first game of the weekend and you could kind of sit back and enjoy the rest of the weekend then and and relax but uh no it was it was a huge win and it was a real uh like i said team performance from start to finish and clearly meant a lot to the lads and you know, I felt that before the game that the players would have been hurt by what happened two years ago. And, uh, you know, the fact that they had been so close to winning the All-Ireland in 2019, they uh, got sunk below in Parky Cueve in 2020, and they really felt they were in a good place in 21. Then Tyrone came, wiped their eye, went on and won the All-Ireland. And I'd say that, that, hurt, that hurt that playing group deeply at the time. And I think... We saw the maybe the remnants of that on Saturday. So, no, it was good, good, good performance. Yeah. Well, what's the feeling in Tyrone then, Enda? Because there's no doubt about it, the air was definitely taken out of you. Yeah, where, where Eamon went on and I had a lovely, relaxed, enjoyable weekend. I can't say the same for us. I don't know whether it was the thrown defeat, but the whole the whole excitement coming into the weekend and building up to it, and we'll probably get on to it later, that for the first match is thrown then just completely the rest of the weekend just got bleaker and bleaker then. I uh, so look, sir, and, and I spoke about it sort of uh, before the game that I feared the carry had the potential to hammer drone if drone weren't absolutely on it, and drone were well off it. Uh, I, I sort of knew Kerry as Eamon was saying they would be really really up for it. They they would have the bit between their teeth, and they done it. They were fearsome in how they played they took no messing they led the aggression right across the pitch they led the energy stakes right across the pitch their tackle count their turnovers of Tyrone was way above where Tyrone was and that that essentially epitomizes everything it, it certainly epitomized what what was seen how the game went so Tyrone will be disappointed it, it was not I, I spoke of that Tyrone needed a massive it was going to need a massive Tyrone performance one of Tyrone's great performances to overcome that carry team because they are they they are excellent, mm-hmm. uh, and and it wasn't and like I, I don't even think Kerry were maybe even in top gear like David Clifford probably could could go on again he was relatively well marshaled from a from a drone point of view or as well as what you're you're going to get I think although the 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 tie up between him and Chrissy McCaig is going to be one that's going to have us all on the edge of our seats to see how that one pans out but. No, look, from their own point of view, there's no getting away that it was a bad day at the office against a great team that uh, put us to the sword in fine style. So we just have to lick the wounds and, and, and go on. It's one of those classic cases. We're not as bad as what we showed. Carrier, the carrier probably not as good as what they showed. There's no point looking at these differences. Uh, it's just the way the modern game pans out. If you're a wee bit off it, you're a mile off it. Mm. Do you know what's funny though, Rory? Enda's saying that maybe people in Tyrone sense that a hammering might be possible. But if you'd have told me at the start of the weekend that Kerry would beat Tyrone by that much and that Dublin would hammer Mayo out the gate, like you might have said, okay, we would have picked these results. There's no way I would have predicted either of those that they'd beat them by that much. And there might be a little bit of scoreboard analysis on the back of it, given the fact that the teams, that three of the four teams that lost obviously had to go that extra week, Jackie. I think mm. that is that is significant. And while I do understand the penalty for not topping your group and the little bit of an added incentive to maybe buy, get that little bye week into you, I think... To my mind, it's deeply flawed. This is the first, this was the big marquee weekend for Gaelic football. 150,000 people paying through the turnstiles to watch four games, none of which really delivered in a competitive sense. And I, the question I would ask is, 
do we want the best version of Tyrone taking on the best version of Kerry? In likewise, do we want the best version of Mayo taking on the best version of Dublin? Then you've got to conspire for your competitions to try and deliver that and give everybody a week off before you get into that quarterfinal phase. I think people were sold a little bit short on that front. The GA will probably say, oh, look, they'll do their metrics by... Look at the turnstiles. I think you've got to go a small bit deeper. And I really, I'm never more convinced now that the preliminary quarterfinals were a massive price to pay for maybe the non-competitive nature that we saw this weekend just gone. Mm. What do you think, Eamon? Do you think if, let's just say, take that Kerry Tyrone game, if Tyrone had another week off, would that game have been closer, in your opinion? I think it would, uh, Jackie. Look, I think uh, a lot of times with games... When you're on a roll of games like Tyrone or like Mayo or like Cork and Monaghan were, what you need to do is stay in the game. And ironically, where you actually, in my experience anyway, both as a player and in the management side of things, where you actually become even more alive is towards the end of the game when you should be, you know, you, you, logic would say you should be tiring. But there's something that kind of you drive on and there's some kind of... um that's the word that there's this this belief that comes into you and that kind of match sharpness and match fitness that you have going on because of the previous couple of weeks. But the flip side of it then is what happened this weekend in, in three of the games. Well, not so much the Derry Cork game, but certainly in the Mayo, uh, Mayo Dublin and Kerry Tyrone games where one team really got ahead of the other team and the fatigued team folded then. And they folded physically and they just weren't able to match the the fresher team that went from strength to strength. So I think I agree with Rory. I think there's a massive case to be made that if you do get an all Ireland quarter final, if they're going to persist with the preliminary quarter finals, still give a weekend off to those victors to give them a chance to gather themselves, refresh, and then come to Crow Park locked and loaded, and that you've every chance because regardless of you know being rewarded for finishing top of the group being almost punished for finishing second or third by the time you get down to the last stage we should be giving them every opportunity yep. to show the best opportunity the best version of themselves when they get to crow park and there's no doubt that there was there was fatigue to be to be seen and Monaghan are the outlier as as they are in most things anyway in football. <laughs> so that's 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 what they do. Like they 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 love to kind of defy logic. But um, yeah, I I'd, I'd agree. I think there should be a weekend off. I I've said it all along. I prefer for there to be no preliminary quarterfinals. I don't think there's any need for them. I think the standard is so even in the groups anyway. There was the margins of victory were so narrow in nearly all of the games that, you know, there was no need maybe to have this extra element of trying to bring a competitive edge to it because it's going to be there. And particularly, like if you look back to Kerry, Kerry lost their first game against Mayo and Killarney. Like if there's only two going through there straight away, there's huge pressure on straight away for the second game, whereas there wasn't really because in, in a, you're thinking in a worst case scenario, we've lost in the last game we're going to beat Laos. Yeah. So even if they'd lost below in Parky Cueve, you know, it wouldn't have been ideal, obviously. But at the same time, there was still that game at the end to get you through. So um, no, I, I, I was never a fan of the preliminary quarterfinals and the way it's panned out, I, I'd be, you know, more, more, more kind of stronger on that. But at the same time, I know the argument that's going to be thrown back. There was great games that weekend of the preliminary quarterfinals and the last weekend of the of the group games. And I, and well, that I'd, and I'd, look at the lineup, Enda, of the of what we thought we were going to get this weekend. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, no, I, I would be in the camp that probably would be still holding fire. I think the preliminary competitions, not only, I think the longer we can keep teams going, and I know this might sound hey, daft when people are talking about too many games and too long to cut teams, but in terms of raising other teams, raising teams that are trying to build, getting them extra weeks of football and training and keeping them camps together on into the summer helps those county teams immensely. If we cut it at two teams, you're going to really, like Westmeath could have, probably should have made it. They wouldn't if there was no third place there. And I think if there can be teams like that, getting those extra big games, that preliminary quarter final, getting that extra game, I think it, it helps. 
I would agree in terms of the gap week. But for me, whenever we're 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 wringing our wrists in terms of how condensed it is, and there's queries about player welfare, and there was certainly injuries picked up at the weekend again, more commonly in the teams that had that, that, that without the gaps, we you can't ignore the elephant in the room where likes of Mayo in this super condensed season that we all had, they had seven weeks of downtime. I think it was seven, maybe six or else seven weeks of absolutely no football. Uh, and numerous other teams had those huge gaps as well. So there, there's still issues with the calendar. There's issues with our competition structure. I'm not, I, I think the, the benefit of the three going through, there, there is a number of things that that, that that benefits in terms of lack of dead rubbers and it keeps the final round of games so, so interesting. And I think it would be even more so next year now that we're wiser to the event. So look, like everything this year, it's very much in a state of flux. Uh, but I, I thought there was value in, in, in the third teams going through and in the games that they gave us last weekend, which were better than this weekend's games. Yeah, yeah and look, Rory, in fairness, we couldn't have foreseen what was going to happen this weekend. I know what you guys have outlined there, that maybe there is fatigue and there is whatever, but we're still talking about some of the best teams in the country. Like Mayo would have rated themselves as big time All-Ireland contenders. Maybe there's a, a conversation about that after the weekend. Tyrone were All-Ireland champions two years ago. Armagh are a coming team. And you will say Cork, we might chat about them in a bit, but like they're certainly one of the teams that has making a, taken a step up over the last number of weeks. So the argument is still that we still had the cream in the last stages of the competition. We did, but we did. And that's absolutely fair. Have we got the four best teams in the semifinals? I would say absolutely we do not. Um, mm. so, so look, there's, there's, there's a flip side on, on all of this. I'm, I'd imagine, I think ultimately, and I saw a couple of people make the point and I look, I, when I was asked way back when the whole thing began, um, and this is not me trying to be smart after the fact, no, I, I'm anything but, but I was asked at the beginning of the year by Mikey, when we were doing it early on, who'd be in the final. And I said, Dublin and Kerry. And the only reason I said that was. In a default year, just go with Dublin Kerry because yeah. it's, it's, it's generally a safe bet, you know. Um, and look, it it is probably the case that that you know there's a good chance that these two will end up in a final. And look, what a brilliant final we will have. My fear is that the two semi-finals might be particularly good. And look, as a lover of Gaelic football, which I am. You know, that's something that you would hope that they will be competitive. I think one of them will be. I think one of them may not be. Um, but Which one look, do you think will be? I, th I, I think the one on Sunday will be competitive. I'm not so sure about the one on Saturday. Without naming any names because you get in <laughs> trouble there straight away. <laughs> Harry and Derry are playing on Sunday just for clarification <laughs> purposes there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, listen, you're being cute enough. Let's yeah. use that as our launch pad then to look ahead to those. Kerry, Derry, Dublin, Monaghan and... Give me a sense, Eamon, of where you think Dublin are at. Because, okay, whatever about being glad that you've finally seen a bit of Kerry, I think it was the first time this year we saw a bit of Dublin as well and, and a true reflection of just how good they are. How much did they impress you? Uh, they were very impressive, Jack, in the second half. Look, we we saw the real Dublin that we probably haven't seen in a couple of years. And, you know, I think to be fair to Desi Farrell, throughout the year this year, he's deepened the squad. He's brought back the lads that were away um, he's got more game time into some of the younger players who've, you know, the likes of Colin Vasquez. Sean Bugler didn't have his best game yesterday. And I know he started the 2020 All-Ireland, but he's still one of those developing players. Lee Gannon has gone on another level. So they've got they've got those lads up a notch and they're playing well. But the big thing is that they've deepened their squad, number one. Yesterday, bringing on Jack McCaffrey, Kieran Kilkenny, uh, Dean Rock, um, Sean uh, are Tom Lehiff and Paddy Small. I mean, you know, this time last year we were talking about different players coming on. They've kept Con O'Callaghan fit, which is which is a huge thing. But for me, the biggest thing was that in the second half yesterday, they were aggressive. They went after the game. They were aggressive on the ball. They were aggressive without the ball. They hit, they tackled, they worked together. They chased the ball when they had it. They moved it. They tore up the pitch in numbers. The hill were involved. All of the things that we associated with, in particular, the five in a row team. Six in a row was obviously the COVID year, so it was slightly different. But that five in a row team, all of the kind of hallmarks were there, going after the opposition kickout. Very good in their own kickout, even under pressure. Um, 
very good. They were very, very good. They really were now. And, you know, it, it looks, and we've mentioned this before, they've won everything. So they need angles. They need particular opposition. They need the big prize to be dangled in front of them um, to get them going. And the Mayo was a huge one for them. They were obviously going to be up for the Mayo game, which they were, and Mayo were well up for it in the first half as well. Um, Monaghan game is a bit tricky for them in that regard, but it's an All-Ireland semi-final. They've lost the last two All-Ireland semi-finals that they've played in. I'm sure they're going to reference that, so they have an angle straight away. And then uh, you'd expect them to be getting into the final. And I, I, I mentioned this, I mentioned it in the radio at Darren this morning. I mentioned it in my piece today in the Examiner. I think the fact that James McCarthy is mm. captain, yeah, I think has to be huge within the group because my God, what a player! What he, a player, he was Eamon. Oh, unbelievable! Yes, yes, Max, like. and and we're seeing it. Look, we're seeing it for ten years. I was I was in an opposition dressing room for six years where we we were looking at him and admiring him, and since since I finished up. Uh, just the appreciation that you have to have from what an absolutely incredible player and we're always talking about the warrior but he's he's a smart warrior he's an intelligent warrior he knows what the game needs he knows how to intervene he he's just oh, he's just brilliant but the point i was making was that in that group he's their captain and there has to be massive massive motivation for all of his teammates to send him up the, the steps of the Hogan Sand to lift Sam Maguire. There just has to be. And it doesn't always work out that way. I remember in 2002, um, Dara was captain Dara, for us yeah. and his dad passed away during the summer. And we were like out of our mind motivated uh, to, to to get him up there. Paddy was our manager. His brother had passed away. The three boys were playing. Um, maybe we were too emotional. I don't know. But we were very, very motivated uh, for 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 Dara to to get his hands in Sam Maguire and it didn't work out. So it doesn't always work out that way. But I certainly think within the Dublin dressing room there is an angle uh, to get to get James McCarthy uh, up the steps and get him to lift Sam Maguire. They're not short of them either, Enda, because when you're a Dublin player and you've got Kerry on the other side of the draw and a chance that, look, I don't want to be disparaging to Derry or Monaghan, but I do think a lot of people are expecting this could be a Dublin Kerry final. If you're a Dublin player, you're thinking, absolutely, let's have at it. Kerry in an All Ireland final, let's go. Not not even the James McCarthy thing. As, as Eamon said, that's a huge piece, but also the motivation to play against Kerry is massive for this group of players. Absolutely, but it's it's probably even more more basic than that. There we know there was a generational group of players there, and they were cruising along at the top of the game and winning all irons for for fun. In in a strange sense, they've now listened to all the critique and all the stuff that be talked about them as players individually and about a team in general. Whenever they're not going so well and they've been down in Division Two, so. They're now coming hungry and with a sense to really prove themselves. And in many ways, an All-Ireland this year will be more valuable than numbers three, four, probably not the fifth in that run because of the historic nature of it, but certainly more than the second, third, fourth All-Ireland's medals that are rattling in their pocket. This one will feel more personal uh, and better to them as players than the ones that they were getting when they were just cruising along because this is the one that they're coming back and they are really proving themselves. Like whenever Stephen Cluxton came back, a lot of chat was about whether right or wrong. There was no comment. The one thing I was thinking all along as a player, he, and there was loads of doubt, there was, Dublin were looking miles off at that stage and everything else and it looked like a desperation thing. But for me, whenever I seen Cluxton going back, I just thought he's going back simply because he knows there is an All-Ireland in that group and it would be a very, very special All-Ireland. And whenever he's back and whenever the other players seen him coming back, suddenly they would have all realised he's only coming back because he knows there's an All-Ireland in this group. And so the, that mentality, and they have that, and they didn't have that during their five in a row. They were going for history, but now they're going to prove themselves. And as the boys are saying, like James McCarthy, but right throughout the team, this team is now a team with the bit between their teeth. Uh, the carry thing is there and that'll, that'll, we'll, we'll have plenty of time, I would imagine, to discuss that. But just right now for, a, for looking at this weekend, it just, for me, reminded me, I suppose, so much of 2008 
when Throne came from sort of nowhere and ironically it was Dublin was the team in the quarterfinal where we suddenly arrived on, well everybody else said we suddenly arrived on stage we knew what was in the dressing room and we came and that was Eamon mentioned that it was the first time you really had a game to go after you really had a game to motivate you and bring out the very best and Dublin reminded everybody that when they're at their very best they're, they're something else and they have so many weapons, Jackie. Like the one thing for me, which is, and I was there yesterday and it was a ple- it was just a privilege to watch them in full flight, particularly in that second half. But they have so many weapons to hurt you with now again. Like Mannion looks like he's after uh, hitting a vein of form. Yeah, Bascal picked up man of the match. Conor Callaghan, no, doesn't have all the pressure up, lumped upon him. Karma Costello was pretty good on freeze and chipped in with a couple of scores from play. And that's even before you get into what their midfielders and their half back line can do so they can hurt you in so many different ways if everybody stays fit and healthy you know this is doubling her back in a big way mm, yeah look it really whets the appetite what about the teams that are coming up against Dublin Kerry then because I do fear Eamon that Monaghan and Derry are going to be like a little sideshow here and everyone's talking about Dublin Kerry which I would suspect really suits them. If you look at this Derry team over the last number of years, they're up there with one of the most consistent teams in the championship. They've done an unbelievable job to get to this phase, back-to-back All-Ireland semi-finals, And I think they might sense nobody's going to give them a chance against Kerry. But that battle, as ye have mentioned, between Chris McCaig and David Clifford, I mean, that'll be just... I'd love to have player cam on that alone. For anything. It'll be, it'll be, be worth whatever the tickets are. It'll be worth it to go in and see that, to be honest. Do either of you give a chance for Derry against Kerry? Eamon, I know you probably can't give us even a thing. But no, Kendall, what... like, look, to be, to, to be honest, Jackie, like I've, yeah. I've been a huge fan of Derry going back the last couple of years, going back to even the, the game that they lost by a point above in Bally Buffet where they didn't pull the trigger right at the end. Remember, they had a big, long period mm. of possession and they didn't get the shot off um, the, the COVID year. So I, I, I've, I've seen the progress that they've made and I've really enjoyed it. I've enjoyed how they've innovated. I enjoyed how they innovated this year, uh, particularly with their attacking play. I expected that to transfer to Crow Park better yesterday than it did. Now, I think that was more a performance level thing than a systematic thing. I just think they they didn't play as well as they can play yesterday. Shane McGuigan had an off day. Um, they're a lot better than that, which is which is a good way for them to be. They won a quarter final without playing their best stuff. They're back to a semi final. They were in an All Ireland semi final last year. They underperformed in that game against Galway last year. So they have the you know the experience. They still haven't cut loose in Crow Park. I think it's a very awkward game for Kerry. I, I I felt for a while that if you want to win the All Ireland, you'd probably have to beat Derry somewhere along the way. So it's it's a very different game to even what the likes of Tyrone uh, brought this weekend. You know the the all out defence, the all out attack. They're going to suck Kerry very much out of shape when they're in attack. Will Kerry? They'll definitely leave up David Clifford. Will they have? the courage or the game plan to leave another one or two up, will Derry match that? Or will Derry still go put everyone forward and trust that they'll be able to um, get their shots off down at the other end? So it's a very different challenge for Kerry. They're not going to have faced something like this. So it's an awkward game. I don't see it as being, you know, this predictable Dublin Kerry thing that everyone's saying. I, I think for it to be an all Ulster final, will also highly unlikely. I think for one of them to pull off a surprise will be a huge achievement. But on the Kerry Derry one, I think it's a very, and that's not just, you know, trying to talk up Derry or talk town Kerry or anything. I genuinely do think it's going to be an awkward, um, yeah. an awkward assignment. But when Derry do go into that 14 v 14 inside the 45, I think play, Kerry have the players to match them up. But even in their forwards going back there, there's not going to be mismatches like Conor McManus and Jack McCarron in, in the in the Ulster Championship game. That's that's not going to happen. So it it will be a great battle, but a different battle for Kerry. Hmm. Yeah, I, 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 I think this is a really, really dangerous tie for for Kerry. I, I think Derry are going better than Throne, have been going for better than Throne for quite some time. I think Derry will come in massively motivated for this game. Like, this is this is their game now. They didn't play particularly well yesterday against Cork. 
they'll not get much credit. They will listen constantly now to being completely written off. Derry, different than Monaghan, Derry have started this year and you have been reasonably open about it. They they see themselves as Ireland challengers. They've been talked of as Ireland challengers and they've been quite comfortable in that place and in that conversation. Monaghan have not. And, and I think that mentality matters coming into a game like this because now when they're being written off, that is just mana from heaven from Derry and they can produce a massive, massive performance almost more guaranteed than than Trone. Kerry are going to struggle to match the motivation that they played Trone with for this Derry game. It will be really, really difficult for Jack O'Connor and those players to get it out of their heads that as long as they look after their business and take care of things, then they should be in the final. That That's a difficult place for them and, and they are, they will be strong favourites. But dare I have the potential to really, really upset them? I do fully agree with Eamon. I, I, I expect Kerry to come through, but this is a really, really dangerous tie because Derry will love, will love the way that this game is going to be built up and them coming into it. Mm. Yeah, for that reason, I think it it is a slippery one for Kerry, Rory. But mm. you watched Derry up close yesterday, and the one thing that I would suggest that Kerry have that maybe Cork didn't have is that killer instinct in the forward line to actually, when they do move the ball, to get the scores. Because when Cork found the gaps, Derry were able to be opened. And Kerry, like, there's no better group of forwards in the country to be able to do that, I would suggest. And Kerry's basic skill set is, generally speaking, and I know this might seem very cliche, but Kerry's basic skill set is normally at a higher level than most other teams, including Cork's. And I just think, like, I mean... It's like a spider's web, you know, with Derry, the way they set up, it's, you've got to kind of, you know, it's a lot of probing around the edges. You're trying to wait for a mistake. You're trying to wait for somebody maybe to find themselves slightly out of position. And then you're hoping to get the shot off. But if you look at yesterday and again, like, as, as I said to you before, I'm not a huge lover of statistics because they, as, as Alex Ferguson famously said, they tell you nothing about character, but Cork's uh, shot conversion rate was something like 37%. You know, like which is which just probably tells you all you need to know in terms of their ability to gain a foothold in the game and to try and actually win, create an opportunity for them to win it. There's no way Kerry will be that low. That's mm. that's just like I'd be absolutely astonished. And like, and the good thing from Kerry's point of view is they still ran up an unbelievable, like a, a pretty impressive score. Two eighteen is still good shooting. And Clifford, oh, no, I'm not going to say he was anonymous, but like, you know, in fairness to Padre Kempsey, he did as good a job as anybody has done in trying to nullify him. But that, to me, is actually a big positive for Kerry and that other player stood up. I think, as the lads correctly pointed out last night in the Sunday game, it was Dermot O'Connor's best game I've ever seen. But somebody who I think is, no, he's not underrated, but like, I just thought Jason, Jason Foley. Like, I mean, the Derek, I, I actually had to check because I was so, you're so looking forward to seeing Derek Hanavan. Like, it, it, they just totally snuffed him out completely. I think he didn't get his hands on the ball until nearly didn't 20 give minutes him the ball. in. Uh, no, they didn't get a ball into him. And that is fair, Jackie. Yeah, absolutely. But I just think Jason Foley in there. I know Tyke Morley does offer that little bit of extra protection. They were well set up to deal with any threats coming down the middle. They weren't going to concede goals in the way they were, but the front foot football, the way he plays that full back position now, I think is a huge positive. And he's as good as there is, athletically aggressive. He's very good in possession. He can take it out of, he can actually, you know, carry the ball. If he, I, I wouldn't say he's a natural full back, is he? Or was he an originally a full back, Eamon? He was always full back, Rory, yeah. But... Was he? Like, look, it's taken it's taken some of the lads. They have huge experience built up at this stage. Jason is on the squad since 2016. This is his eighth season. So, mm -hmm. you know, he's he's an experienced operator at this stage. Like he's still he's still a great age profile and everything else. And Dearman O'Connor, and I would have said it before, people needed to be patient with Dearmid. Like he is he is 24. He has been around the the, the, the squad for a couple of years, but Playing inter county midfield, especially as the number eight, it takes it takes time, it takes experience, it takes games, it takes setbacks, and you know he he's had those. But uh, to be fair to him, he was he was outstanding on Saturday, and and there's there's more to come from him because he has he has everything, he has all the tools that that you need to be that number eight. And that will be a fantastic battle as well, like Glass yeah. Rogers versus Dermot O'Connor, Jack Barry. I mean, that's another real one to savor. 
Mm -hmm. What else from this weekend then, Enda, stands out when you're looking at your, you know, your final four teams in it? What are your key takeaways that that you're seeing after that? Uh, I suppose the the defence of football, that is still there. And I think that does impact the quality of the games. I think that will further the discussions when with such an appetising weekend of, of football. And it, it did fail, for me, it failed to live up to expectations. Uh, the lack of energy in the teams coming through the additional round, I think that is definitely a factor and needs to be factored into to the respective wins because, again, it's not suddenly that those teams are so far ahead. I think you have to look across their general season, but certainly whenever the top teams are motivated, Kerry and Dublin are, are still a step up. Uh, it's very hard to see Derry and Monaghan turning them over, but I suppose for me, coming home, the, the feel-good one, was Monaghan for, yeah. for me <laughs> because they're sitting in the Lerland minor final. They're sitting there in the Lerland semi final. They struggled to get a manager last year, and Vinnie Corey has stepped up. The job he has done with them, the quality that they're playing with, like it's it's very easy to get into the narrative of it's, it's just this spirit, this Monaghan spirit, but the quality they're able to play with the younger players and the speed that they have now entering into that team. Uh, the tenacity they always bring, the honesty they always bring to their performances. I, I just think it's it's stunning what they're doing. Uh, and I just hope that they get the mentality right. Because for me, for years, I don't think Monaghan genuinely believed, and I think it always held them up. I don't think they genuinely believed that they could punch and win in all Ireland. Probably different than the other eight teams that have routinely been in Division 1 who all thought uh, we, we can win all Ireland. I don't think Monaghan genuinely held that belief and I think that routinely stopped them getting there I did feel coming into this weekend that when they were playing Armagh in the quarter final that that was their chance I don't think they would have had a huge fear of Armagh in that regard but now they're playing a team that they absolutely do have very likely an inferiority complex to they have to lose that they have to lose that and, and, and come to that game with everything they have because they do have quality. They have more quality than maybe they get credit for. Uh, but just brilliant. What a what a win for them. Disappointing for Armagh, obviously, the, the travesty of losing on, on another penalty shootout. But you, you, you just have to applaud Monaghan. Mm. That was one of the key takeaways for me, Eamon, is one, yeah, look, the penalty shootout drama, it is it is desperately a uh, horrible way for Armagh to go out. But I think the resilience of this Monaghan team is one of the things that I take away from this weekend. Any of us that know football people in Monaghan, they just live and breathe it. And I do wonder now how much belief they take out of a weekend like what they've just come through. And do they genuinely believe now that they are a top four team and can they beat the dubs? Yeah, like Enda said, Jackie, I think they have to believe it. Look, there's there's a good cohort of that group that were there in 2018 um, and they were in the All-Ireland semi-final and they didn't make the, the final jump into the final. And they'll know there's no... It's not that there's no prizes. There's no... Um, losing an All-Ireland semi-final is the worst game to lose. There's no... There's nothing to take from it. There's just absolutely nothing to take from it. It's just a gut-wrenching disappointment um, to miss out and getting into the biggest day of the year uh, after an All-Ireland semi-final. So the likes of Car- Conor McManus, uh, Rory Began, um, Jack McCarron would have been around the place in 2018. Carl O'Connell. Carl O'Connell. Uh, Hughes Brothers. Oil, mm-hmm. the Hughes Brothers, Began. Duffy, all of those fellas. They have a very experienced cohort. They're going to be saying to the young lads, listen lads, this comes around once every five, sometimes longer years for the likes of us. We have a great group. We have a great manager. We have a brilliant coach. We have great spirit. We have good momentum. You have to cash this in when you get here. And, you know, again, we were talking about James McCarthy earlier, Conor McManus again in the contribution he made, because I imagine he's had a frustrating enough season from his own point of view, because, you know, he's so good. And like he he he's not going to be wanting to come in as this impact sub. He's he's wanting to be playing and he wants to be the man as he was when he came in. And Carol Kane, I saw, had a, a stat from the Irish News. He'd have sat up on Twitter after the game and he was saying that McManus has scored nine two hundred and forty in the championship and one forty three of that has come after the sixtieth minute. So nearly twenty percent of his scores 
comes in the last 10 minutes of the game, the clutch scores, the match. Well, Vinnie Corey, didn't he call him that? The greatest clutch player of all time. He's proven that, isn't he? Exactly, exactly, exactly. So they, they're, I think that's going to be the message within the group. Of course, Vinnie Corey himself would have been there in 2018 as well in that, lads, it's all well and good saying, oh, great, we're in an All-Ireland semi-final. This is that that's not the game you want to lose. So um I I I think they're 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 gonna have that belief and they're gonna have a real cut at the dubs. And one thing traditionally, and I found that dealing with them um coming up against them, they they are excellent shapeshifters, they're brilliant tactically. So many of their players are flexible tactically, they can play different roles, they can throw different things at you with Rory Beggins booming kick out it gives them another weapon so they have you know they have weapons to test Dublin and they have beaten Dublin in league games they've beaten Dublin even in Crow Park in league games so it's it's an interesting dynamic uh, obviously with the way the Dubs played yesterday in the second half if they bring that again the next day there's probably no one that will live with them but um, Monaghan I, I think will be viewing this they can view this as bonus territory they have to view, view it as an opportunity Hmm. And like what an opportunity, Rory, playing in a full house in Croke Park in an All-Ireland semi-final. You know, as, as Eamon said, it, it is, I wouldn't say it's now or never for this Monaghan team, but it's definitely now. It's a massive opportunity right now. And uh, some of the players, I think, uh, I only got an opportunity actually to watch the game a full day this morning. And like uh, Gary Mohan is playing some great football and Conor McCarthy. I mean, some of the scores he he kicked from distance. And that's the other thing that they can do. I mean, they don't necessarily need to penetrate these mass defences. They do have lads that can kick from range. The only thing, and look, and again, I suppose the Monaghan folk will be out and forced to give me plenty of stick over this. I can't get over the fact that they still lost to Donegal. Um, now, I've probably slaughtered two counties there at the same time. But you are talking about a team that did lose to Donegal only a couple of weeks ago. And we're expecting them to go into Croke Park and beat Dublin. Bridge too far for me, unfortunately. Mm. You're living we... up there too long, Rory. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, he just you know he, he can't he couldn't he couldn't let that happen. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. Can I can I ask you one other thing about that game? Right, the penalty shootout, Eamon. Mm. Like when you're involved as a manager in the penalty shootout, I heard Vinnie Corey saying afterwards. By the way, they didn't practice penalties, which I find incredible. Arma, you would imagine, have to be doing nothing, only practicing. Penalties, well, they get plenty of practice in yeah. game, Jackie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but like it does. I know there's drama. I know there's jeopardy. But I do think not only is it awful for Armagh to go out two years in a row to the same thing, but also to have the same five penalty takers taking them and the same lad to miss two penalties. Like there's something wrong fundamentally with the game that allows something like that to happen, in my opinion. I don't I don't know how you feel about it. Uh, it was terrible. It was terrible, Jackie. It was, I felt so sorry for uh, Camel Cum- Callum Cummacy on, on Saturday evening because... First of all, when it when it came around again, and when it went into the sudden death, they rejigged, and yeah. I was saying I was watching it. I was up in the RT box, and I had the perfect perspective from up there, and I was saying, "What's going on here? Can they do that?" Has he just said, "Please, lads, leave me till the last, and hopefully it won't get as far as me in the sudden death." And then I thought it was so telling as he was walking up to take the penalty. The four lads that were standing there, the four other Armagh lads all put their hands on their heads. It's not and exactly a ringing endorsement. No, it was. <laughs> but it's it, also it was, an awful position for a fella to be in, you know? It was. I, I'd, I'd love to see a thing that if if it goes to sudden death, that you can either sub a fella out or or else, like maybe, you know, Gary Mohan then obviously is the flip of it. He, he had to take a second penalty as well and he stuck it. But the fact that it came down to the two fellas who missed again to be taking the fifth penalties, it was, it was, yeah, it was, it was horrible. I felt so sorry for him now. And, um, you know, the thing about the not practicing, I found hilarious afterwards, like, because their penalties were of such top draw, the man and penalties. They, he mightn't be organizing the practice, but they're certainly practicing them somewhere because <laughs> it's, it's, that's a skill like, uh, you know, converting penalties is a skill and, Obviously, you can't uh, train the pressure and the moment and the crowd cheering at you and all that, but you can practice your technique and putting them into the top corner and uh, Kieran Hughes clipping it in off the post and everything. There, there was, there was a good bit of practice, or else they're very, very lucky. 
Mm. That was the thing. And uh, I was watching him yesterday, obviously, with Colin Cooper, Peter Canavan and Cora Staunton, three of the best strikers of the ball I've ever seen. And they could not get over the standard of the penalties. They thought they were unbelievable when we were watching them back. And I just there's there's something of a cruelty in it, the way people go out. But you have to applaud some of the penalties we saw as well. They were unbelievable. Yeah, look, it's brilliant drama and it's it's the result of the condensed season again. But uh, I think at a certain stage, replays would be lovely, but the nature of this season particularly, uh, that's not going to work. The quality was awesome, to be fair, and under that pressure, like it, it is massive pressure. The psychological element that comes into having to hit a second penalty, having missed the first one, like penalties alone, and I, I have to completely <laughs> disown any knowledge or ability in this regard i hit one my last ever competitive one in an under 16 league final and there's a very good reason why i was never allowed <laughs> to hit another, another spot kick so i admire fully these boys that can hit them uh but the the psychology that goes into taking such a high pressure penalty kick and then if you miss to have to hit one again is just cruel and unusual punishment if, if ever there was one so I, I don't know why they, they went with that approach rather than do the sort of the more standard approach where it's sort of a, a continuous change of player. Uh, but look, it was it was tough watching it. Uh, never mind for, for those involved in it. But I thought Vinnie Corey showed massive quality and dignity in how he spoke about it afterwards. And I think anybody genuinely uh, that has played the game, I think we all sort of know when it comes to penalty shootout, you're down to essentially a toss of a coin. In terms of that, but I'm sure Monaghan will go on and make the very most of the opportunity that that they've now got. Yeah, that's it. I actually have to say, Rory, I thought that was, you know, look, sometimes when we get post-match interviews from managers and players, there's a little bit of, I'm sure they're never going to say anything anyway. I have found this year, it has been really refreshing to see a lot of them just being so open and honest about it. And Vinnie Corey saying, look, we didn't win a match. We won a penalty shootout. I did think was good of him to say in light of what had happened, actually. Yeah, it was, but and there isn't quite a bit of sympathy for the plight of our man. Exactly. In, in so yeah. far, in so far as you're losing three penalty shootouts in a twelve month period, two quarterfinals and an Ulster final, I'd be slightly less sympathetic. I'm very harsh today. Maybe I'm cranky. Yeah. I don't know. I'm sorry, but I would be slightly less sympathetic. There was there was a fabulous moment in the fifty fourth minute. Reen O'Neill played this beautiful ball off the outside of his foot from inside his own half, Brilliant. where where he opened up. The, um, he opened up the Monaghan defence and Rory Grugan was effectively cleaned through one-on-one, -on -one, now kind of cutting in from the side. And I'm saying, this is a goal, like he's got to go for a goal here. And he elects to fist the ball over the bar and it sort of encapsulated Armagh's approach to the game in that they were very tentative. I felt that it was a game that you were kind of saying, go for it, like just go, this is there for the taking and they never took it. And then they paid the price in a penalty shootout, which is cruel. But, you know. I, I think that'll definitely stick in the craw of, of our ma is the fact that when you look at the three other teams that had played last week and their fate over the weekend and then their own difficulties with putting our ma to bed and our ma, when they're really in their pomp, are such a strong run inside and they mm. are can be really difficult to live with. Not being privy, being in the dressing room, being the team beforehand or knowing what way they were approaching it, it's, it's always foolish almost to to think that that you know the inside line but they did seem to be playing more tentative than maybe what they should be or could have done and if they really stretched Monaghan and Armagh played to a level that they were exhausted you were then assuming that Monaghan surely would have been struggled to keep up with that as the other teams struggled over the weekend but uh, it's always in the benefit of hindsight but certainly Armagh it'll not make the result any easier for Armagh to take the fact that the other three teams that played last week came up short by quite a bit yeah mm. can we finish off on the last of the teams that went out I know we've touched a lot on and we will come back to semi-finals again over the, the the next couple of weeks but just a final word on on Mayo and where you see them going Eamon because it does seem to me that at the start of the year they beat Kerry in that game in the opening round of the championship everybody's saying they're all Ireland contenders they're league champions you know where do they go from here? Because Kevin McStay, as Joanne rightly referenced yesterday, said this is a four-year term. This is the beginning of a new project for him. I heard Cora Staunton last night talking about some retirements in Mayo. Does it seem to you 
like the end of an era for a Mayo team? Or where do you get the sense of, of, of where they are? No, I don't think it's the end of an era at all, to be honest, Jackie, because I think there's a new crop coming. Um, you know, uh, David McBride, Sam Callan, Jack Coyne, uh, Tommy Conroy, Ryan O'Donoghue, all that gang, they're, they're young. Some of the older stalwarts, the likes of um, Matthew Ruan, um, Paddy Durkin, um, who else? Ain't no shame. He'd be probably a bit further on than even them. There's still some of those key players that are good, good age. Uh, Dermot O'Connor. Then you have the likes of Aidan O'Shea and Killian O'Connor, um, uh, Kevin McLaughlin, Jason Doherty. They're in the older bracket for sure. But a lot of a lot of their team, I think, to be fair to Kevin, he's got a lot of you know new talent in who got a lot of high game experience this year. But it's been a very strange season for them, Jackie. I think when you when you sit back and you look at it this morning and. Kevin, after the game, said that he was he wasn't. Um, I can't remember the exact word to use, but he wasn't heartbroken or he wasn't mm-hmm. going to be broken hearted about it. But I think this week, when he thinks about it, he will because during the league, and I saw them a good few times. They were brilliant. They were getting so much right. They were playing so well. Um, I'm not just talking. Clearly, they were ahead of teams physically for a while, but it was their approach and it was just the way they were playing. I thought it was it, it was excellent. But then they lost to Roscommon. I felt at the time that was something that was going to help to help them because it was going to give them a bit of a break. And they mentioned it earlier about that gap to get ready for the championship. I saw them in Killarney and I said, oh yeah, here they come. Here they come. This is their opportunity now. Um, They're going to be, there's two months or whatever in it and they're coming to the boil at exactly the right time. And then you see them against Laos and it's a completely different performance then they lose to Cork and then they find themselves in the situation that they were in having to go to Salt Hill pulled a great win out of the bag there but I think the derby nature of that game probably changed the dynamic of it maybe in in terms of the farm line and then we saw them again in the second half yesterday so they ended up playing was it six championship games they won three they lost three so Mm. that's that if you're it's going inconsistent to win in farm. It's very inconsistent farm. It's very it? inconsistent to try to try and go and win in All Ireland. So I think when they reflect, they are going to be disappointed because on the bus going down to the Gaelic grounds to play Cork, they were in a great position. They were in a great position. They beat Laos, not playing well, but they needed to bring everything. And they did for three quarters of the game. They were in a great position at, at three quarter time in that game. And they conspired to lose it. And the next thing then, they're gone at the quarter final stage. So they haven't gone any further than they, than they did this time last year. I wouldn't be writing them off and saying that it's the end of an era. There may be a retirement or two, but I think they brought through enough this year to mean that, you know, the transition is going to be quite smooth. Because mm, I was saying to friends of mine, and even in advance of the game, if Mayo had beat Dublin, they would have beat Kerry, Galway and Dublin and they were still only in an All-Ireland semi-final you know mm-hmm. you were thinking the road that they had to travel this year like so Eamon is right there's still there are just wonder how deflating it is given the position that they were in a couple of weeks ago I'd say so like it just feels it's, it's only what three four months three months probably since there was just so much hype and joy around Mayo and everything like I was we were laughing for a long time like Kevin McStay just mustn't have wanted the dream 10 for a while like everything was going absolutely perfectly uh, but I, I remember writing a, a piece midway maybe game five in the National League and I was saying we've never had it so good because the teams were going hammer and tong at the National League and it was the brilliant league that we've become accustomed to and in my thoughts, looking ahead to the championship and the convoluted nature and not knowing then how it would sort of pan out, but just thinking, I think the biggest lesson teams are going to take from this year is that they have to keep their powder a wee bit drier in the earlier part of the season. And nothing that I've seen since, and certainly last weekend, certainly uh, isn't isn't going to change that opinion. I think the national, I think teams will still go for the national league to an extent. I think maintaining your division one status, getting a decent placing in the league, is is going to remain important. But it's not going to be as important. Like for a, a long time there, we had a great correlation between the teams that were going well in the league and the teams going well in the championship, and would quite often double winners were 
championship and league success went hand in hand, which was a brilliant thing and only added to the league. Uh, but I think this year, I think that has changed. And I think next year teams are going to say, okay, we're building in the National League and we're getting we're building our panel in the National League, but this is not the be all and end all. And even come the group stage, it isn't about absolutely flying out of the gate. It's about coming to this stage, the preliminary quarterfinal or the quarterfinal, and that's when you have to measure up. And that's certainly the the lesson that everyone will be taking from from this year, I think. Mm. Listen, Mayo, like a lot of the other teams, Rory have a, a whole rest of the year to consider it, which including Cork, and I know you're devastated after the weekend watching them, but for all of those teams, for for Mayo, for Tyrone, for Armand, for Cork, there are harsh lessons in that in terms of the, the year and, and the way that they've approached it. And I'm sure for everyone, there's massive learnings in terms of, as Enda said, trying to look at the calendar and actually peaking for the right times too. Exactly. And like, I mean, look, from a Cork perspective, I think, there was good progress made again. And I, you know, it was really encouraging, actually, in the pre-match warm-up. Kevin Flahev took a full part in that. So you'd imagine he'll be back next year and Sean Meehan. That'll make Cork quite a formidable defensive unit. Um, they've still got a couple of really good midfielders in there. And I thought Killian O'Hanlon going off actually was a big loss in the game mm-hmm. because I thought as soon as he went off, they couldn't get a handle on kickouts at all. Um, but the biggest concern from a Cork perspective is up front. That problem will have to be solved and I think it will uh, you know and I think there are different teams will take different things out of the season one thing that I th- I, I did think and I'm like, listen I'm not going to be given out here because it's not it didn't make any difference to the result and to be fair even though it was a four point victory it, it should have been more I mean I think had Shane McGuigan converted the penalty I think that would have probably been a fairer reflection on the balance of play but I did think it was really curious to put an Ulster referee in charge of the back-to-back Ulster champions when you didn't have to. Like the free count in the first half was 10-2. Is that unusual? Do end uh, Eamon. 10-2 in the first half. It is. Yeah. Now, it is. does it look, it made absolutely no difference whatsoever to the result. None. The better team won, and they probably should have won by more. But I often find it very curious that the GA put themselves into these positions. Like Goff was doing the other game. Why just swap them around? It was an unnecessary decision, and it put, I felt, McQuillan into a slightly compromised position. But look, I don't think it made one blind bit of difference either way. And I think John Cleary's made good progress. The key thing now is just to up their conditioning again and just try and drive it on. They've got plenty of time to do it. Everybody will go back to the clubs they'll take a couple of weeks off like they will in most counties and the club championships will start fairly soon and to try and find it'll be like every county now you go back down to the bottom of the ladder but you go and see if you can find a couple of players that can maybe boost your chances heading into 2024 for the rest of us we just have to look forward to the last um to the last two weekends of intercounty football and we're and we hope will be good yeah look sorry the the thing Mm -hmm. with Cork Rory is that John Cleary mentioned it himself. They have to get back up to Division One. Yeah, if they get up yeah. to Division One. They have to stop their messing in in the league and get back up to Division One. And you mentioned their forwards. If they can keep everyone fit, they've Sherlock, uh, they've Brian Hurley, they've Connor Carvis, they've Cahill O'Mahony, and they've Chris Oak Jones. Five of those as your your front three. Then with the likes of Owen McSweeney, Kevin O'Hanlon. Powder, depending on where he's playing, mm. all those they have serious talent up there as well. So as as well as getting the likes of Sean Meehan and and Flahav back, the, if they if they can keep everyone fit, and that has been certainly an issue for them over the last couple of years. Trying, you know, they're they're getting these chronic injuries where players are missing the whole season basically. Mm. So I think that's a big part of the jigsaw for them for the re- the, ne- the next six months. That when they when they reappear next January or February, that they have a fully fit, robust squad. Because if they have, they've they certainly there's plenty of talent there. Mm. Well, there's definitely promise there. Last word then on Tyrone, and uh, you know, as you sign off for 2023, Sean Kavanagh tellingly on the Sunday game was saying Tyrone are a long, long way off winning another All Ireland. How big of a setback is this now? What does it give? I suppose everyone in Tyrone time to think about it in terms of getting back to the top table. How far off do you think they are and can they come back? Oh, they can absolutely come back. They're still good talent. We only won an under 21 learn a few years ago. Like so mm-hmm. where the, the talent is still there within the county. Uh, they certainly have had a significant dip following that All Ireland win. Uh, and it's 
almost that it has put some players back. Can they regain it? Callum McShane came on and, and done well. That was pretty encouraging because he's been plagued with with injuries. I think there's there's more to come from some of our, our younger forwards. There could well be a wee bit further changing of the guard. Some of the older heads will very likely think about things. I know they were thinking about things last winter in terms of the likes of Ron McNamee and Matty Donnelly and Petey Hart. So this will be a time for them all to sit down and evaluate their own home situations and everyone else and see are, are they going to go again. Uh, but there is enough talent in behind the scenes. We lost quite a few players uh, over the past few years, sort of really strong panel members, which is so critical uh, at now in the championship. So that probably needs to needs to change. There needs to be a, a willingness to be part of a bigger panel uh, because you can't get anywhere. As Eamon was saying, like some the, the likes of some of those boys that played brilliantly over the weekend, the likes of Pasquale, the likes of Jeremy O'Connor, they're there several years uh, before they really step up and, and come good at county level. And I think the level is so great there at the minute that that's, that's what's needed. That's a long-term commitment. You need to run your panel that way. Uh, but I would fully believe the throne will still be within the top eight conversation next year. And I think when you're there and with Tyrone's recent history and belief in ourselves, you hit form at the right time. I, I think we, we can always be in that conversation and with a wee bit of luck, you can always get over the line. So, uh, no, we're not going to be favourites or anybody's favourites next year, but I think we'll still be in the conversation. Mm. Well, look, plenty of time to give that uh, some thought and plenty of time for us to look ahead to those semi-finals as well in two weeks' time. But lads, we'll leave it there uh, for now. Eamon, Enda, thanks a million for being with us and looking forward to a bit of hurling to come at the weekend as well. So myself and Rory will be back on Thursday to chat that. In the meantime, have a great week, everyone. by winning the last two matches on the road and that's not going to be taken away from us. What I love in Hurland, I love players that will never give in. He hits it! He hits it! It's over the bar! Oh! Holy Moses!